everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. So the great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, I got a job for me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if mom and dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. I'll chase him round the moons of Nibia and round the Antares maelstrom and round Perdition's flames before I give him up. I shall leave you as you left me, marooned for all eternity, buried alive. Come! Star Trek II. The Wrath of Khan. Uh, welcome to Everything Old is New Again. This is Douglas Viviani with David Cohen himself, the Star Trek aficionado. David, how are you? Oh, you're you're saying I'm the Star Trek aficionado? I'm throwing I, the baton. Wow, here. I'm honored in your presence being the all the all Star Trek uh, know it all. Well, I have to tip will. my cap to you, and and uh, but I have to also say that I'm no longer the aficionado aficionados because our guest this week is more of an aficionado, if you will, and a creator and writer and director of Star Trek. So, David Cohen, why don't you introduce our special guest? Yes, we're excited, Doug, to have here with us Nicholas Meyer, who is the author of three Sherlock Holmes novels, including The 7% Solution, which was on the New York Times bestseller list for a year. He's also a screenwriter and film director responsible for The Day After, Time After Time, as well as Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, which we just heard there, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, and Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, among many others. And I'll tell you what, at this point in time, there is something else to talk about besides Star Trek, and I'm happy to do it. Uh, a new Sherlock Holmes book, the fourth that Nicholas Meyer has produced. It's coming out in October, available for pre-order now on Amazon.com, The Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols. Uh, we will definitely get into and dive into that for sure, uh, talking Talking about that on our show, but we can't uh, go too far a field here to just. We've got to start, if you will, with something uh, Star Trek related. But first, uh, w welcome to everything old is new again, Nicholas Meyer. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Ah, uh, great. Um Happy to have you, and uh, definitely, like I say, we will be talking about, I want to talk about this new Sherlock Holmes book, uh, but first, you've been credited with, and by many people say this, that, that you're the man that, uh, if you will, saved, or was part part of saving the Star Trek franchise after the first movie bombed, if you will, and didn't really capture the magic of the TV show and the driving force you were behind the uh, uh, the Wrath of Khan as a writer and, and director. So do you feel that uh, have you heard that before? Do you, I know this is hard to say, but do you feel that maybe someone that hasn't been or wasn't really a Star Trek fan, from what I understand, before uh, you took on this project, that you were able to bring a fresh eye to the uh, the project, and, and maybe that was some of the, the reason for the success of, of The Wrath of Khan? Well, you're raising a lot of points. First and foremost, I'm trying to remember all the things you're asking me. <laughs> First and, um, do I think I saved it? The answer is, I may have contributed to it. I was part of a lot of people who worked on it. Secondly, you know, I'm not really among those who knock the first movie because I feel I learned an awful lot and someone had to go boldly where no one had gone before, and that was Robert Wise. So I take my hat off to them. It may be true that because Star Trek at the time meant little or nothing to me, I had not watched the show, that I was able to bring some fresh perspective to it when I first was asked to become involved, and then I started watching the episodes and being shown the movie and having conversations with our Bennett, the producer. Yeah, I was looking at it really for the first time, and more or less as an adult, albeit a slightly adolescent adult, I guess. <laughs> and it reminded me of certain things that I have always loved. Submarine movies, movies about battleships and destroyers. Most particularly, I suppose, a series of novels that I read when I was about 13 
about the adventures of Captain Horatio Hornblower, who was an English uh, sea captain during the Napoleonic Wars, and he had many adventures and a girl in every port, and all of which seemed pretty cool to me. So I think I came at it from the standpoint of the Navy and rejigged everything in what I took to be nautical terms. And the rest of it is, you know, movies, I've said this many times, movies are like souffles. They either rise or they don't. And sometimes you just get lucky. And I think a lot of the times with my movies, I've been lucky. And sometimes uh, luck along those lines uh, goes or follows you because you carried that luck, if you will, through all of the Star Trek movies and others, which we'll get into for sure. Um, I just wanted to play a little bit of a clip here, just for the fun side of things, in that The Wrath of Khan did have an effect upon our pop culture, and that's what Everything Old is New Again talks about. About it many times, and if you hear this clip, hopefully you can hear it. Is a little bit of Seinfeld where they reference uh, Wrath of Khan. Let's hear this for for fifteen seconds. What are you saying to the Rosses over there, anyway? Oh man, I don't know. I, I told them her death takes place in the shadow of new life. She's not really dead if we find a way to remember her. What is that? Star Trek Two. Wrath of Khan. <laughs> hey, Kramer, I saw it last night. That's a hell of a thing when Spock died. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there we go. I'm sure you've heard that before. I don't know. I, I thought that that was an interesting nod to the movie and to yourself, so to speak. And and I'm wondering if you uh, were familiar with that or aware of that was going to happen before it did. And did, or did it take you by surprise that uh, Seinfeld was going to give you the nod there? Well, I didn't know anything about it until my mother called me very excited to say <laughs> that she had seen it. And subsequently, of course, I've seen it. Interestingly enough, the line that's quoted, he's not dead as long as we remember him. That's quoted in the sequence, yes? Yes. That line was not original to The Wrath of Khan. I, I read it in a newspaper the day we were filming that scene, and I was so taken with the, the line, and I'll tell you in a minute where it comes from, that I put it in the scene that day, but it it was quoted, it, the person saying it was Simon Wiesenthal, the famous Nazi hunter, and he was saying it in connection with the Swedish diplomat, Raoul Wallenberg, who had saved many Hungarian Jews during the last days of the Second World War. And Wallenberg, uh, in 1945, disappeared without a trace into the hands of the Russians, and nobody knew, and still doesn't, uh, to this day, what became of him, and whether he died in 1945, or died in 1960, or whatever. And somebody asked Simon Wiesenthal, do you think Raoul Wallenberg is dead? And he said, he's not dead, as long as we remember him. And I thought, that has a pretty wide and moving application. So I grabbed it, and Seinfeld, you know, took it from the Wrath of Khan, but that's where it originally came from. Well, a true example of everything old is new again, in that you nod, and, and we all do this, take uh, things from what happened before us and uh, and apply it to our present works, and hopefully uh, add, uh, or at least uh, continue that thought uh, through the, the ages or through our works. So I think that's really interesting, and, and you've done that in other ways and other times in other works, so we'll dive into that in a few minutes when we continue with Nicholas Meyer and talk about the adventure of the Peculiar Protocols, which uh, we say is adapted from the journals of John H. Watson, M.D. Again, Mr. Meyer is, is someone that has written three others, including the 7% Solution. I read that back in the 70s. And by the way, if you were to try to find the 7% Solution now, it's difficult to find, and or if you do find it on eBay, what have you, it, it carries quite a price. So uh, it, it is a work of art that is uh, revered to this day. Well, you can order the book on Amazon. It's easy. Yes, I, I, I should have said the. I'm talking about the original. Actually, if we wanted to get the original uh, print of the Seven Percent Solution. Oh, oh, didn't know. But yeah. I did take your point. Uh, it's interesting now that you've called my attention to this. Everything old is new again because I am a big believer in almost any form of recycling. I'm interested in recycling garbage. I think 
you know, not only is that essential and useful, it's probably profitable, especially since China is no longer taking our garbage. Somebody could make a lot of money if they figured out how to recycle the stuff we're putting into landfills. I love recycled architecture. I love when I first saw Garadelli Square and the cannery. Um, and those buildings were made new again. I'm fascinated by all that. And I guess with homes, I'm recycling homes. So re recycling everything old is can be made new again is something that resonates with me. I never thought of it in those terms until I recalled the title of your program. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, we'll be back right after this, and everything old is new again. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. An ancestor of mine maintained that if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And so that that's ancestor he's talking about, and he's half human. Fictionally speaking, quite possibly could have been Sherlock Holmes. And I'll tell you why. Listen to this. If you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Once you rule out the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. Obviously a famous quote from Sherlock Holmes that Spock mentions in The Undiscovered Country, written by a uh, expert or fan of Sherlock Holmes, Nicholas Meyer himself, who co-wrote that and directed that movie. And he says Mr. Spock's ancestor, basically, is Sherlock Holmes. Right. I just think that's very interesting. Yes, very you've cool. successfully hammered that point home. <laughs> now, hammered heard... and hammered and hammered. One other point. Sherlock, you know, the BBC series. And he his, continues. His, his star <laughs> is Benedict Cumberbatch, who was Khan. No! Yes. No! Was Khan in Star Trek <laughs> Into the Dark. All right, there we go. I'm sorry to confuse anybody out there, but that was on tape. We were back every old is new again that was a discussion from our show 108 if you want to hear that on everything old is new again dot biz uh talking about believe it or not a tv show back and then at that time in 2016 that came out called houdini and doyle of course arthur conan doyle we're talking about there and and uh and we have a guest with us joining us uh, that may have some interest in that and who we actually spoke about previously in that clip nicholas meyer nicholas thank you for joining us welcome back oh thank you it's a pleasure to be back and was i right uh was sherlock holmes an ancestor or at least uh, did you try to lay that uh what do they call it e they call it an easter egg now in these shows right was that something that that you intentionally put in there as an ancestor of mr spock well everything i put in was intentional of course <laughs> and so it was that conclusion that i made way back when something that uh, was on the mark here's the thing <laughs> very dangerous, I think, and perhaps self-defeating, right. to think of artists as the answer to a book of math equations at the back. I think artists are people who put messages in bottles, and once they're done and they toss the bottle into the wide world, their proprietary authority ceases, their opinion is just one more opinion. And it isn't, there's no such thing as the word definitive in discussions of art. So I can't tell you what to think about what I did. I might think, I might concede, oh yes, I hoped for this or I intended that. Um, but I'm not even sure how reliable at this point such recollections would be and I don't think they should be used to settle arguments, which are perhaps more fun if they remain ongoing. Exactly. And that's what we like to have here on the show. We call it the arguments you love to have. We uh, pretend to know things and throw them out there. And hopefully, uh, as you say, the, the, uh, the idea of the argument continues when the radio is turned off, if you will, from our show to just say, gee, maybe that was, maybe that wasn't. But what an interesting idea that is. And along so those what, I will, what, yeah. what I am conceding is that nothing that comes out of Spock's mouth or anybody else's mouth in any of the movies that I wrote is there by accident. 
Exactly. I tell, tell my kids that all the time when I, they're watching movies and, and trying to see what's going to happen and so forth. Say, whatever that was in the beginning there, you know, pay attention. It's just as important as what happens at the end because it's everything that's on that screen or everything that's in that novel, every word that's been presented, the writer put there for a reason. It wasn't just a, a, just a, you know, a passing thought. So uh, I, I am glad to, to hear you say that. Now, along those lines, there seems to be uh, an interest, of course, that you have in Sherlock Holmes, um, and as well as H.G. Uh, Wells, as well as Harry Houdini. Uh, so uh, those are some topics that we uh, have taken a look at in the past as well. And... I'm just interested and curious because you were uh, the driving force behind Time After Time from 1979 as the director and the writer, and Houdini in 2014, the miniseries, as the writer, a great miniseries with Adrian Brody. So um, there must be, I'm trying to dive into and see, is there certainly an interest in the Victorian era or these characters that you have, and and maybe, if so, uh, what drives you in that direction? Well... The answer is, of course, there is a an interest and a unifying interest as far as uh, once you get to Arthur Conan Doyle, and Arthur Conan Doyle was a contemporary uh, of Sigmund Freud. They were both doctors. They both died in London within nine years of one another. Doyle was also a friend and then a great enemy of Harry Houdini. My father was a shrink, and he wrote a biography of Houdini, which became the basis of that miniseries to which you alluded a minute ago. So these things are all wrapped up in my mind. I grew up reading and loving, I think, uh, Victorian and Edwardian prose, the sort of thing that Ernest Hemingway really did away with. Um, but whether it was Robert Louis Stevenson or H. Ryder Haggard, or Anthony Hope, or Charles Dickens, or George Eliot. I really loved, fell in love with, and remain in love with uh, the English prose of that period. It seems really beautiful. And the idea, uh, the sort of building block prose that we read now, which is really no different from journalism and what we'll call James Patterson prose, that that doesn't do it for me. Um, so I keep, I guess, hearkening back to days where vocabularies were bigger, where adjectives were fewer and verbs were more plentiful. And yeah, when you put those characters into the mix, it, it all sort of reflects my state of head and and there seems to be uh you know what you're saying to me is that there are stories to be told and that's one thing but the second thing is how the story is told and the way that uh, you are presenting the story the language that you're using and that was used back in the day uh, we've done that uh ourselves on the show we've read a little bit of uh Frankenstein and uh, and Mary Shelley and and uh and even Dracula and so forth and you could see the way that the word picture is painted in these novels that really make it come alive, of course, because there was no television at the time, and and uh, and and the theater of the mind really was was through the the novel or the book itself. So I, I connect with what you're saying, and I wonder, did you try to do any of that with the adventure of the peculiar protocols? Uh, which is the new book uh, that you've written and, and can be pre-ordered now and is going to be coming out October 15th. Maybe I guess you could tell us a little bit about what the book first and then your method of, of presentation of, of the language that you used in that book. Well, in the first place, it is another uh, missing manuscript from the hand of uh, Holmes's biographer and amanuensis, John Watson, and therefore, yes, is written... Uh, certainly in an attempt to capture the flavor and language of Watson. This book takes place in 1905, uh, somewhat later in their uh, careers, where Holmes is actually contemplating retirement. Um, 
but it's also uh, it's a sort of a stealth novel. It's it's a little darker in some ways, and it is based on real events. And I'm not sort of too keen to go into the uh, actual events, which will be sort of self-explanatory when uh, one hopes you read the book. Um, but it's it about a plot that may or may not have been genuine to take over the world and about an investigation into the perpetrators of that plot that Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock's brother, hires him to undertake. And, yeah, it's about, you know, trying to capture and use that language you, you you used the phrase a minute ago to sort of paint word pictures, um, and I and English, which I've always loved, um, and probably Shakespeare's English the best of anybody, um, really captures my imagination and my heart. I guess it is also true, and I would have to just say it by the way that as a fan of Leo Tolstoy, who wrote my favorite novel, War and Peace. And Tolstoy had a very different idea about language. He kept everything as simple as he possibly could keep it, so that it, it, it almost reads like he spot run and Dick and Jane, because he wanted anybody and everybody to be able to understand without any difficulty what he was saying, and he used very, very simple language to paint extraordinarily complicated um, images and, and uh, descriptions, but he never used the kind of big words, let's say, that the Victorian writers we've been talking about uh, felt free to, to use. It's one of the reasons that Tolstoy works very well in translation, because you're not knocking yourself out to find you know, English equivalents for words that aren't that complicated in Russian. Does that make any sense? It sure does. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. I wish I could go into it in a little more detail, but we're up against a commercial. We're going to pick this up when we get back with Nicholas Meyer, The Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols. Uh, check it out now on Amazon.com. Pre-order. You're going to want to read this. We'll be back right after this on Everything Old's New Again. What's up? Get the flame springing from the mirror and at least flooded the advancing men. He strikes them head on. The logs are turning into flames. The whole field caught up by the woods of fires. The, the gas tank tanks for the automobiles are spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now. To... This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. The ABC Friday Night Movie. The Martians have just landed. The radio said it was the end of the world, and the world believed it. This is the most terrifying thing I've ever witnessed. They've landed on Earth. New Jersey's under martial law. Orson Welles conceived it as a radio play. We are ready to attack. But it turned Halloween into a nightmare for millions. How could they think this was real? It was the night that panicked America. Ah, oh, there we are, back with everything old is new again. David Cohen with Douglas Viviani here. David, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Douglas. Do you how remember? You? Do you remember this? Uh, I show? do. I do. That was 1975, the night that panicked America. Before we took the break, we heard the original little piece of the Orson Welles' War of the Worlds, the radio drama from 1938. Believe it or not, there was a night that panicked America in, on, in 1957 on television. Way back when, before all of this, was 19, 1897's H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, the, the novel itself. Truly, everything old is new again. We're joined uh, by Nicholas Meyer, who is the force behind that 1975, the night that panicked America again. Uh, this is something, uh, Mr. Meyer, that we have spoken about a number of times, of course, because we're in radio, so we've focused a little bit more on, on the original uh, uh, play by Orson Welles. But uh, this obviously is something that you also have an interest in. in. What made you or drove you to, to write or get involved with the screenplay for this uh, particular subject? Well, first of all, 
I am everything old is new again. <laughs> Aren't we all in some way or another? Well, I'm, I grew up, you know, on Orson Welles. I grew up on Citizen Kane, on the Magnificent Ambersons, on Touch of Evil, on um, Chimes at Midnight, Othello, Macbeth. Orson Welles, to me, I guess when all is said and done, and he wasn't always, I mean, the, the, the output is uneven, but he's the greatest director the movie as a movie director. I think Orson Welles is the greatest director. And I had a recording of the night that the War of the Worlds broadcast. And I remember playing it for a, a girl one night in college who didn't realize it was a phonograph record. Just to see circa 1967 if it was still scary. And in 20 minutes, she was hysterical, going, what is it? What is it? I said, well, it's the record. Um, and, she, you know, she was just, it was not my best moment, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> so, yes, it had always resonated with me as part of Wells's peculiar genius. And when I was offered the chance to write a movie about it, I did. I don't think I did a very good job, by the way. Um, and the title wasn't mine. I... I wanted to call it The Night the Martians Landed, and and CBS, I think, in its infinite wisdom, uh, changed it to The Night That Panicked America. I'm not sure that it made any difference. You see, the thing is that, that I was 13 when that came No, let me get a... Yeah, 13 when that came out, and uh, I'm talking about The Night That Panicked America, and it inspired me, and therefore you sort of inspired me, to go ahead and find the... Because there was no internet back at that point. The, as you say, the record was somehow find what this was based upon to listen to the Orson Welles broadcast. And I sort of do that now every night before Halloween. I try to expose it to my children a little bit. They're 10 and 7. And uh, I just think it was such a very creative way to use the medium of radio. And then I enjoyed well, that, that Wells was nothing if, if not creative, but we should also uh, stop a moment to tip our hats to the other Wells, mm -hmm. uh, H.G., who, in addition to the writing the novel, The War of the Worlds, was an altogether remarkable character. And he wrote also The Invisible Man and The Time Machine. And then he sort of got bored with sci-fi and didn't, didn't write anymore. It's interesting that his great rival, of course, was Jules Verne. Right. And they were very different in the way they approached their science fiction. Jules Verne, when he shot a man to the moon, he knew what he was doing. He did the math. He figured it all out. He knew that they'd leave from Cape Canaveral. He knew that they'd land in the ocean and have to be rescued, you know, floating uh, by a ship. Right. And he, he got all the details right. And when he did his submarine, the Nautilus, in 20,000 leagues again, he figured out the cubic feet, the cube, the math, the ballast, everything. When H.G. Wells sent a man to the moon, he simply invented an anti-gravity material called Cavorite, and he just put his lunar voyagers in the Cavorite here, and they just loaded up. And so floated he, away. He really, he really didn't care that much about science fact. He was into, you know, total fantasy, and Vern said, well, this is nonsense, there's no such material, and so far, he seems to be right. Right. But that doesn't make H.G. Wells less than prescient or entertaining, because he obviously remains so. And certainly was someone that was the centerpiece of Time After Time, a movie that has been discovered and rediscovered by people, uh, you know, from uh, the VCR to, to now on demand. And I think uh, most people that are exposed to this are surprised because they, I, I think the marketing maybe on that one was a little difficult for them to do to promote this work of art, I think. And, but in the long run, the love story that that movie is, 
is set in time travel with characters. Jack the Ripper and H.G. Wells was so creative, so well done, and I, I tip my hat to, uh, to you on that front, and I'm sure you've heard this before, and they've even had some conventions I've seen on, uh, on YouTube and, and uh, people talking about this movie. It's, it's uh, something that's a, a gem in the, what, how do they say that, a diamond in the rough that, where um, I don't know that uh, everyone has seen it, and, and I'm going to expose everyone that I can to it because it, it's an adventure, it's a love story, it's time travel, it has it all wrapped up in one, and uh, I, really, I really am happy to have you on to talk about that a little bit. Uh, how did that develop in your mind to, to put all of that together? I guess we're, we're coming to that question. Well, I'd love to take <laughs> exactly. credit for this, but in truth, uh, the story was written by a guy I knew that I had gone to school with at the University of Iowa, uh, whose name was uh, Carl Thunberg, who called himself Carl Alexander, and he came to me and he said, I'm writing a novel that is inspired by the 7% solution, and I have 65 pages and an outline. Would you read it and tell me what you think? And I said, sure. So I read it, and I thought, what a great idea. Of course, I'd never have such an idea. But um, it then occurred to me that I could option his, his book, which I did. And then I wrote the screenplay sort of the way I wanted it to go. And what I, it's the first movie I ever directed, and I, I guess I did a lot of things wrong. But it sort of didn't matter because the script was, yes, so good. It was very, very good. And the actors that I cast were so wonderful um, that my my directing ineptness sort of doesn't make any difference. And and the, you you alluded to something which I think is true. And again, this is just my opinion. It's not definitive. It's just an observation that time after time seems to be five movies wrapped up in one. It's science fiction. It's a romance. It's a comedy, it's a thriller, and it is a social commentary. And I think the movie lends itself to multiple viewings because it is all those things. And on different occasions when you look at it, different aspects of it pop into the forefront of your um, receptivity. It, sometimes you'll see it as sci-fi, Sometimes you'll see it as a social commentary. Sometimes it'll be all about the romance. Um, but it lasts a long time. And it's not to be confused, by the way, with that other movie called Somewhere in Time with Christopher Reeve and uh, I think it's Jane Seymour. But this, this one is Malcolm McDowell and David Warner. Uh, and it, as you say, it's on demand and it's finally been released on Blu-ray. Oh, and that's great to hear. And Blu-ray, there's a little commentary by yourself, or no? Sometimes I do that. I can't remember. Okay. I know I did an interview about it, and I, I'm not a wild fan of commentaries, even though I've been told that my wrath of con commentary is pretty good. But I can't imagine watching a movie with someone yakking in my ear while I'm trying to, you know, see the movie. Yeah, I think some people like to do these commentaries that they've seen the movie three or four times, and they finally get a different perspective, maybe from behind the scenes. And that's what we're trying to do I here. The director yakking about the real estate. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not a fan of it. I like movies. I like art that raises questions. I'm not a crazy about art that answers questions it's like explaining magic tricks and usually once you've explained the magic the kind of gas goes out of the balloon makes total sense and uh hate to cut short but we're going to be back right after this with nicholas meyer on everything old is new again uh take a look at amazon.com to pre-order the adventure of the peculiar protocols you'll not be disappointed i guarantee that and take a look at the others you'll see three other sherlock holmes uh works of art uh books as well listed on amazon.com we'll be back right after this and everything old is new again this is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. It's a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done before. A far better resting place I go to than I've ever known. No, you can't get away from me. 
hell's heart. I stab at thee for hate's sake. I spit my last death at thee. Uh, we're back here on Everything Old is New again. A couple of quotes uh, from The Wrath of Khan, but originally from Moby Dick and uh, Tale of Two Cities. We're here with David Cohen, Douglas Viviani, and Nicholas Meyer, who's going to try to give us a little insight there. I, I notice, of course, we spoke about this a little bit, that you're a fan of the literature of the day or back in the day. And, and again, uh, using those quotes really, to me, made this movie uh, come alive and have some depth to it. And I, I thought it was uh, sm so smartly done, well done. Uh, but it's it's something that seems to be what you're saying is you've done that before and, and you enjoy doing that where you give a nod to some literature of the past, let's say. I guess I'm hoping that if you like the quotation, you'll go read the book. Exactly. And, and and that's something that, you know, people came out of the movie and some people asked me where the quotes came from. And I said, did you see the Moby Dick book in the spaceship or the, you know, the cab cabin, if you will, that, that uh, Khan was living in in the beginning of the movie? Uh, that was uh, Moby Dick and the rest was Tale of Two Cities. And, and people, oh, they nod. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, not a bad idea to pick one of those up and if you like this movie you're certainly going to like like those works of art that's for sure so it is something that was also referenced a smidge of what you're talking about he was referenced in star trek 4 that was the voyage home just play a real quick clip here and let's talk about that for a moment the use of language has altered since our arrival it is currently laced with shall i say more colorful metaphors double dumb ass on you and so forth you mean the profanity yes that's simply the way they talk here Nobody pays any attention to you unless you swear every other word. You'll find it in all the literature of the period. For example? Well, the collected works of Jacqueline Suzanne. The novels are Harold Robbins. Ah, the giants. There we go. So my question <laughs> would, fits right into our discussion here, uh, juxtaposed to H.G. Wells, right, and... <laughs> and uh, and and Dickens. Uh, who would you think would be some of the giants, if, if if there are any, of literature today? If who you're reading today? Well, I I think I mean I was an enormous fan of Philip Roth. I you know just who recently died, but I, I thought Philip Roth. I think Philip Roth is a very great writer. I was always a fan um, of. Of John uh, Cheever, uh, John Updike, Saul Bellow, Gail Godwin, Marilyn Robinson. I seem to be naming a, not, a lot of people from the writers' workshop in Iowa City because I went to school there. Well, that's that's a good start. I mean, and speaking of Iowa, by the way, we're broadcasting just to give a nod on KMA, KXEL, KS. CJ, all of which uh, reach into uh, the Iowa broadcast area. With Michael Chabon, I like Michael Chabon. I like uh, Ian, Mc is it Ian, I can never say his last name, Mc who wrote Atonement. I think that guy's a terrific writer. I like Julian Barnes. Those are English guys. I like an American historian whom I think writes beautifully, Joseph Ellis. Well, that's a great list to, to start off and, and to take a look at for our listeners to, to dive into some, some real good literature. And, and along those lines, uh, something that is different for the day. So take a look at those. But something that was different back in the day in 1983 was something called The Day After, which was a movie that, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to play, I have a short clip of an announcement that was made that I think is very different and unique for television that was made before The Day After was played. So we'll play this clip real quick and then we'll come right back. Hello, I'm John Cullum. In this evening's ABC Theater presentation of The Day After, I play a father in a typical American family who experienced the catastrophic events of a full-scale nuclear war. Before the movie begins, we would like to caution parents about the graphic depiction of nuclear explosions and their devastating effects. The emotional impact of these scenes may be unusually disturbing and we are therefore recommending that very young children not be permitted to watch. In homes where young people are watching, we'd like to suggest that the family watch together so that parents can be on hand to answer questions and discuss issues raised by the movie. 
So I thought that was very interesting that had to be done. You directed that movie. That was in 1983. I remember that specifically as being uh, disturbing in a in a kind of a social change kind of way. In other words, I couldn't sleep for, for quite some time after that. I know America and, and even our politicians on some level uh, took note, I think, of that. And uh, along with many of your works, it had a social, social message to it, obviously. It was about a nuclear uh, attack. And um, uh, again, you directed this, so you, you had some certain interest in this. It, the larger picture, most of your work seems to have at least raises social issues and discussions and uh, try to make some uh, issues and topics aware to the listener or reader. Uh, am I on the, the mark or no? Well, again, I am not the, the best or the last or the definitive judge of my own mm-hmm. work. I can say that I've always liked telling stories. It hasn't much mattered to me whether it was a funny story or a sad story or a future story or a past story, so long as it was something that I thought was a good story. And somebody said, well, what's your definition of a good story? And I found myself saying, well, I I think a good story is a story that once you've heard it, you understand why somebody wanted to tell it to you. And I suppose that living in the real world, as I think we all find ourselves doing, I'm more interested in material that deals with the real world. I'm not interested in superheroes. I think people who are interested in superheroes somehow have given up on life. They're looking for extraterrestrial rescuers of some kind and that that seems like a kind of a fantasy to me and i suppose occasionally i enjoy a fantasy but more often than not i'm more interested in stories and movies and plays and books about real people trying to figure out and how to deal with being alive and what to do with the problems that confront us. And the problems could be problems of love affairs or problems of politics or problems of, uh, you know, planetary survival. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I just would like to be inspired. Tolstoy said the purpose of art is to teach you to love life. And I also think that art has the power to shape our perceptions of the world. And so I'm always drawn, I think, to stories that address that question or those questions, loving life, how you see the world, um, and rather than sort of guys in spandex, um, doing their thing. Uh, maybe not. A, I, I also love the, the novels of, of John le Carre, and I remember that after I read The Little Drummer Girl, I thought, well, this makes the case that the best kind of novel is the political novel. I, I didn't want to direct the day after. I think I was the third or fourth director um, that they asked, because nuclear war is so upsetting that who wants to think about this stuff? Um, But then I thought, well, somebody better think about it. Um, And I was being psychoanalyzed at the time, and my shrink said while I was lying on the couch trying to rationalize my way out of not doing this movie, he said, well, I think this is where we find out who you really are. And I thought oh, hell, now I have to do the movie. (laughs) Um, And that's how I became involved. It was kind of a long-winded, discursive answer. Well, that's okay, because that it is something that is worth a while talking about, because it, I think you must have seen and heard that there was a lot of feedback uh, from that, and it was a, a unique project for sure, and a uniquely uh, and well done. Uh, well, it turned out to, to have changed Ronald Reagan's mind about a winnable nuclear war. Ronald Reagan, when he became president, uh, came to Washington believing 
in the idea of a winnable nuclear war. And after he saw the movie, he uh, changed his mind and went to Reykjavik and signed the Intermediate Range Weapons Treaty with Gorbachev, which I believe um, our current president has just uh, abandoned this treaty in his infinite wisdom. Right, and, and I'll tell you, that has to be, at least at the time, it had to be uh, quite a, a, a feeling to be able to affect things for the better through your art. And I wish we could go into that in more detail. Maybe we'll have, we'd love to have you back to, to dive into some more of that. Uh, right now, I wanted to say that we've had a, an absolute pleasure speaking with you. The adventure of the peculiar protocols is something that uh, if, if uh, you are in any way, shape, or form interested in heroes, well, there are heroes in that book. Uh, of course, Sherlock Holmes being that person. And it's, it's well written. It's got some great uh, advanced reviews. If you want to go on Amazon.com, you can uh, look at those advanced reviews. Pre-order this. It's coming out October 15th from Nicholas Meyer. Uh, Mr. Meyer, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. We're happy to have you on Everything Old is New again. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Great to hear that. We'll uh, look forward to, to reading the novel, maybe having you come back a little bit, maybe in October. We'll see. All things entertainment, pop culture can be found here on Everything Old is New again. Come on back next week to continue our exploration of all things pop culture. Of course, I think, Captain... Second start of the ride, and straight on till morning.